Chapter four is going to be concerned with doing calculus uh, using a computer, and in particular, doing integration and differentiation. We saw in the previous chapter how um, many optimization problems are tackled much more efficiently if you've got gradients available. So in the typical statistical uh, case of maybe wanting to optimize a likelihood, maximize a likelihood, um, you would really want to ideally have the derivatives of that likelihood function available. Uh, if you can do that analytically, then great, you definitely should, but very often that's uh, tricky for some reason, and so um, you might want to use a computer to do it. And similarly, uh, often for non-trivial problems, even evaluating a likelihood for the observed data, the so-called observed data likelihood, uh, very often involves marginalizing out some nuisance parameters, say some random effects, and in that case, um, you want to integrate them out. So you can integrate them out analytically, again, if you can, but very often that will be tricky. And so you might want to numerically integrate out some variables. And so even just evaluating the likelihood might involve some numerical integration. So numerical integration and differentiation crops up a lot. Um, broadly speaking, um, neither... A trivial. Uh, so numerical integration is typically uh, computationally costly, uh, especially as the dimension goes up, uh, but reasonably numerically stable. Whereas numerical differentiation, at least in the um, obvious situation of using finite differencing methods, um, that's usually cheap, um, but potentially very unstable, as we'll see. And so that's not trivial either. Um, but we're also going to look at automatic differentiation, which is becoming increasingly important uh, in recent years. And that changes the equation a little bit regarding uh, numerical differentiation, but we'll come on to that later. So one thing that's really important to get your head around as soon as you start thinking about numerical differentiation is cancellation error. Uh, operations we do on the computer are finite precision, um, that has implications for many computations you might do, but in particular, when you start differencing two numbers that are very similar, uh, cancellation becomes very important very quickly. And of course, that's exactly what you're doing when you're evaluating numerical derivatives. So understanding cancellation error, where it comes from and how to mitigate it uh, is uh, very important um, in the context that we're, we're thinking about here. So here's a nice little example that uh, always frightens people the first time they see it. So we're going to set A to be uh, 10 to the 16. We're going to let B be 10 to the 16 plus pi. Then we're going to subtract those two numbers uh, to get pi. Okay. So uh, we look at D and it should be pi. We know it should be pi, uh, but it's not pi, it's 4. Okay. And so the first time you do this, it's kind of shocking. Obviously, I'm not giving this lecture live, but very often when, when I give this lecture live, there are people with laptops in the audience, and the first thing they do is pop up an R terminal, and they type it into their R terminal and see if it's really true. Uh, but, it, but it is really true. Um, it happens because of cancellation error. So we know what the answer should be. It should be pi. But we see that when we actually carry out this computation, we don't get pi, we get 4. So that's a bit disturbing. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in the relative error, it's about 30%, which is pretty terrifying. So it happens there, but when does it happen more generally? And it basically happens whenever we subtract similar numbers, and in particular, um, big similar numbers, but, but they don't have to be. It's just if they're very similar numbers, the error we're going to get um, in the result, um, at least relative error is going to be big whenever we subtract two numbers that are very similar in magnitude. Okay, So to understand what's really going on, um, it's quite helpful to look at this little example here, which is obviously done in decimal, not binary, but um, that's what we're more familiar with. So if we think about, suppose we could do calculations to um, 16 significant figures. Then we've got our A, which is 10 to the 16. Uh, we've got our B, which is 
10 to the 16 plus pi, but to 16 significant figures, that's not exactly 10 to the 16 plus pi, it's 10 to the 16 plus a little bit, and that little bit is the best we can do. Then when we subtract them, we subtract all of those leading significant digits, and all we're left with is the least significant digit, which was the only one that differed, and that's where our three comes from. So that's exactly what's going on here. And the problem is that, yeah, you, you've got a, a fixed number of digits that you can use to represent your number, and that's great. Um, and that often works very well. So floating point very often works very well. Um, even for dealing with numbers of different magnitudes. But the problem comes when you subtract these two numbers of very, uh, that are very similar and lots of the leading digits are the same and so they just drop out and they just leave you with uh, the digits from the end and if you don't have very many of those, then you don't have much accuracy. So that's really what's going on. Now, we don't get three when we do this in R because obviously floating point on a computer is being done uh, in binary, not in decimal, but it's exactly the same thing that's happening. You've got two very similar binary numbers representing the, uh, the significant digits and most of them are the same. So they drop out and just leaving you with, with the a few digits at the end and uh, that doesn't give you very much accuracy for your result. Okay, so that's it. That's cancellation error. But clearly it's going to have a big impact on numerical differentiation because that's precisely what we're doing when we do a finite difference derivative. But, but before we go on, let's just emphasize the fact that it doesn't only crop up um, when you're doing numerical differentiation. This is the issue of cancellation error crops up um, all over the place. And another nice statistical example is, suppose you want to calculate a variance in a single pass. Um, so you don't want to have, um, well, yeah. So sigma x squared and n x bar squared are gonna be quite similar if you've got uh, a, a large number of numbers that you're adding up. And so when you difference them, most of, those, most of that uh, most of the significant digits are going to be the same and you're going to have the, the same issue. So there are lots of ways you can deal with cancellation error in general, but um, uh, they tend to be quite problem specific. What are the best ways? So one simple thing you could do here is just center the computation. So rather than just doing the sums of the squares and uh, and the, uh, the, the sum of the X bars, you could... Um, uh, center according to the first observation say x1 and then if you you know make sure you've got a, an expression that's mathematically equivalent uh, you can do that but you see that those terms are going to blow up much more slowly uh, and so you're not going to have this issue that you got two numbers of very large magnitude that are very similar that you then difference you you actually going to have uh, much much better behaved uh, accumulators as, as the number of terms increases. And so you're gonna suffer much less from cancellation error in that case. Now, there are lots of other ways you can do a one pass method for calculating a variance. I mean, this isn't the only way you can do it, but it's just illustrating the general point that cancellation error crops up in lots of places, not, not only in numerical differentiation. Okay, so does the same problem affect numerical integration? Well, the answer is no, not in the same way, because in numerical integration, um, especially in statistics, we're usually integrating positive functions. Um, and there, in that case, we, we, we're adding things up, not subtracting them. So we, we're adding up lots of numbers, but, but addition is much more stable than subtraction. So if we look at the, the error, say, uh, in adding uh, our A and B rather than subtracting a and b then the error is tiny yeah so even though we're not representing either a or b perfectly because well b in particular we're not representing perfectly we might worry that that's going to give some error in the result it does give some error in the result but it's only in those least significant digits so it really doesn't matter uh, so as long as you're adding things up um, you, you tend not to worry so much about the, uh, the loss of precision associated with floating point uh, arithmetic. Um, but when you start subtracting things that are similar in magnitude, that's when the problems arise. Right, so let's now turn our attention specifically 
to the problem that we're really interested in here, which is approximating derivatives and gradient functions generally using a finite differencing approach. So how do you differentiate numerically a function f? Um, well, the obvious thing to do is sort of the, the definition of a gradient that you probably first met when you first did calculus, which is to uh, just look at the function shifted along a little bit um, and compare that to the function at x, the value that you're interested in, and divide it by the difference. And um, you can think of this geometrically as being the gradient of a chord, and you can think of your derivative as being the gradient of a tangent of the curve at the point x. And as you shrink the chord towards, um, towards the, the value of interest, then the gradient of that chord becomes more like the gradient of the tangent. And that, that is how you even motivate the whole notion of a derivative when you first meet it. And so that obviously suggests a way you could estimate the gradient, which is to choose a small number uh, and just use exactly the gradient of that chord. Now, we know uh, from understanding calculus and limits, etc., that the gradient of that chord becomes more like the gradient of the tangent as you shrink your difference interval. So uh, we know to get an accurate result, we're going to have to use a small finite differencing interval that here we've called delta, um, because otherwise, you know, the gradients are not going to be right. So that error is actually called truncation error, uh, because we think of it as relating to uh, Taylor's theorem, and it's the error that we get by truncating the Taylor series to uh, essentially a single, well, uh, just the uh, constant and linear terms. So that's really what we're doing when we are using this finite difference approximation. We're just using the uh, first order Taylor approximation. So we can use actually the, the second order Taylor uh, approximation in order to get a handle on the error. Um, so if we think about the error associated with using this finite difference approximation, uh, we, can, we can bound it. So if we know something about the we'd say we can bound the second derivative, then what we see is that the error in that finite difference approximation is linear in the finite difference interval. So we obviously halve the error by halving the finite difference interval. Yeah. So you've, you've, you're comfortable with this idea of approximating the derivative using this uh, gradient of a chord, and you intuitively know, I'm sure, that you get a better approximation by reducing the finite difference interval. But what this is uh, giving us here is being very clear about the fact that the error is essentially linear in the finite difference interval. So if we're just thinking about the problem uh, mathematically and uh, ignoring any issues to do with floating point computation, then clearly choosing a smaller uh, finite difference interval delta would be good. And ideally we'd choose as small as possible. Okay, so that all seems reasonable, but we haven't thought about the fact that we're representing these numbers um, using finite precision on a computer. And if we are, then these two numbers here, uh, f evaluated at x plus a little bit, and f evaluated at x are going to be very similar. And then we're going to subtract them, which we know is going to be problematic. And then we're going to divide by a very small number, which is going to blow up any error that we've made when we've done that subtraction. And so this is why numerical differentiation is a very unstable process numerically, because this is just doing all of the things that we really don't want to do. Right, so let's think about that more clearly now. So floating point arithmetic is actually quite complicated, and we're not going to get into the, the full detail of exactly how it works, but we're going to just assume that um, you know, the intuitive idea that we're working to a, a particular number of significant digits, which sort of means you can represent numbers, you know, up to one part in something. And so uh, let's just assume that we can calculate f to one part in epsilon for some epsilon or, or epsilon inverse, if you like. Um, so epsilon then is going to be tiny, uh, we hope. Um, and it's, it, you know, it, so ideally, right, epsilon will be machine precision, but we can't always calculate um, 
f to machine precision anyway because f might be a complicated function but we're just going to keep things simple and just assume that we could calculate f to one part in epsilon inverse and so um, we sort of thinking of epsilon as being kind of like our machine precision so if that's the case then if we stick a bound on uh, f then we can say that our computed value of f uh, relative to the true value of f should be less than epsilon lf and that's basically just our assumption right so that's this is basically the mathematical statement of our assumption that our computed value of um, of f of x is going to depend linearly on this uh, tolerance or accuracy or precision that we've called epsilon so that seems reasonable, but that's true basically for any x because L, LF here is a bound. And so it's going to be true for this x as well. And if we now put these two uh, inequalities together, we can get uh, the thing that we're really interested in, which is how the computed value of the derivative relates to the value, the finite difference derivative that we're attempting to compute. So obviously this isn't the derivative. This is the finite difference approximation to the derivative, but this is the computed value of that finite difference approximation, and they're different things because machine accuracy is only up to uh, a tolerance of epsilon. So we just put those two inequalities together and we get the factor of two here, but the crucial thing is that because of the delta on the bottom, we've got epsilon on the top, which we'd expect, but we see we have delta on the bottom, which is blowing up any errors right and so that is exactly the problem here that we're blowing up the cancellation error and so if we put those two sources of error together we've got our uh, truncation error if you like our error from uh, truncating Taylor's theorem to the first order and then we've got our cancellation error or round off error or finite precision error whatever you want to call it and when we put those two errors together we've got one term that has a delta on the top because that's telling us we want to make delta small to make the error small but unfortunately this other term has a delta on the bottom and so that what that's telling us is that it's dangerous to make delta too small because our uh, computational error is going to blow up so what we could say is, well, can we just choose delta to minimize this overall error? And of course we can. We can just differentiate that with respect to delta, uh, equate it to zero, rearrange for delta, and we get this, uh, this delta here. And so what does that tell us? Well, in general, it tells us that our error, uh, sorry, our optimal finite differencing interval delta is order root epsilon. Okay, so that's the thing at the bottom there. But there are lots of assumptions uh, underpinning that. And in particular, uh, we're assuming that LF over L is roughly uh, one, or in fact, roughly a quarter. But, you know, factor of two is neither here, here nor there. Um, but um, yeah, we are assuming that LF and L are of similar order. So those two bounds, uh, we're assuming a, a vaguely similar order. But, you know, that, that will often be a reasonable assumption. And so uh, the rough rule of thumb is that Again, we said that epsilon isn't necessarily machine precision anyway, uh, and there are assumptions here as well. But roughly speaking, uh, if we're going to have a, a kind of a rule of thumb, then roughly our finite differencing interval being approximately the square root of machine precision might not be too far wrong. It might be wrong by an order of magnitude or two, but it shouldn't be too far wrong. And so that's why we often do use the square root of machine precision as a finite differencing interval. But that doesn't mean it's always optimal. Um, it certainly isn't, but it's at least a, a kind of ballpark rule of thumb type uh, starting point. Yeah. So there is a lot more to it than this, and if you want to know more about it, you'll have to dig into the literature, but that at least gives you a starting point. But probably worth just saying is that clearly there are different ways of numerically differentiating. Uh, we, we've just done the forward difference there. Um, there are other ways to evaluate a, a gradient, a first order derivative. So for example, we could use uh, the centered differences. These are known to be uh, more accurate, um, but the problem is uh, 
that they're typically more costly because um, you probably already have an f of x lying around. You probably want f of x for other purposes. Uh, and, but here we've got to now evaluate two more. Uh, we've got to do two more function eval evaluations, not just one. So uh, these are a bit more expensive, but they're actually a bit more uh, accurate in general. However, uh, the cube root of machine epsilon or machine precision um, is probably what you're going to want here. Okay, if you work through the, the same analysis, uh, the cube root of machine precision is what comes out as optimal. So you need a, a slightly bigger uh, finite differencing interval for centered differences. Uh, similarly, um, what if we want Hessians or, or second order derivatives of other sorts? Okay, so well, here's a, a simple second derivative um, using the obvious kind of straightforward formula for um, that second derivative there. Um, so the, crucially, what you end up with is a delta squared on the bottom, and uh, that delta squared means that you're kind of blowing things up even more. And so your optimal uh, finite differencing interval turns out to be the fourth root of machine precision here. So you see that these slightly more complicated derivatives, you uh, need to be a little bit more cautious about um, your choice of finite differencing interval. Uh, you don't want to make them too small, otherwise uh, you're going to end up with more cancellation error creeping in. Okay, so that's about all I wanted to say about that. Before moving on to think about numerical integration, I think it's worth spending uh, a little while just thinking about other methods for doing numerical differentiation. So by numerical differentiation, we've really meant um, using a finite difference approximation. And um, we kind of understand that problem now. But maybe there are other ways you can differentiate functions using a computer. Um, so if you've ever used a computer algebra package, maybe one of the things you're thinking is, well, can't I use a computer algebra package to differentiate um, any function that I'm interested in? Well. For simple-ish functions, you can do that, and that can work quite well. Um, but symbolic differentiation, which is what these computer algebra packages do, uh, suffers from some very nasty uh, problems for anything really non-trivial. Essentially, the number of terms involved in a symbolic derivative uh, can grow uh, unreasonably big very quickly and e easily. Um, so uh, essentially, the problem is that if you think about uh, your function, uh, that involves a number of terms, say. Um, the number of terms in the symbolic derivative uh, is often vastly greater than the number of terms involved in evaluating the function. And so as soon as you move beyond very simple functions, um, just doing a symbolic derivative through that function um, can be completely impractical. So it turns out that actually the interesting problems, uh, particularly the kinds of interesting functions that arise in statistics like non-trivial likelihood functions, etc., uh, symbolic differentiation, um, apply, at least applied naively, is not a good solution very often. So um, actually that, that's not used very often at all. So although it maybe seems attractive if you've done symbolic differentiation with uh, tools like Maple or Mathematica, and you, it kind of seems a bit like magic, um, actually that, that doesn't work so well um, for complex functions for, for lots of reasons, but intuitively the number of terms explodes. Um, however, one of the problems with that is that you're trying to when you do a symbolic derivative, you're trying to differentiate the whole function. So you're trying to represent the entire derivative function. Whereas when you're executing an algorithm, you don't need the entire gradient function. You just need the gradient at a particular point. And so that changes the sort of genuine underpinning complexity of the problem. So one of the sort of deeper reasons why symbolic differentiation is problematic is that it's overkill for what you need. You only need the derivative of your function at the particular point you're interested in. You don't need to know the derivative function everywhere in order to 
say, run an optimization algorithm. So it, this then raises the question, can we, in fact, um, use an idea very like symbolic differentiation, but rather than simply um, using simple derivatives and concepts like the chain rule in order to construct an entire derivative function, instead just use those to numerically evaluate the derivative at a particular point. And you can, and that's what we mean by automatic differentiation. So one of the many attractions of automatic differentiation is you can often set it up so that it works directly on the same, essentially the same code that you would use to evaluate your function. So say you're dealing with a likelihood function. You write a function to evaluate the likelihood. Um, that same function can then also evaluate the gradient of that likelihood with respect to its parameters. You don't have to write different new uh, complicated functions in order to get a derivative. You really want to simply write your function once and then have the code the, the automatic differentiation library give you a, 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 an ability to evaluate the gradient of that function at a point of interest as well as the function at a point of interest. Yeah, so when you code up your function, it's going to give you f of x when you give it an x, but when you use it in conjunction with an AD library, as well as getting f of x back, you also get grad of f back okay that's the idea without you as a user having to do anything different or special and without placing severe restrictions on the kind of code you can write inside your function so that's the idea behind automatic differentiation and uh, it works surprisingly well uh, in many cases uh, using modern automatic differentiation libraries so we're not going to get into uh, the details of exactly um, how all of these libraries work but uh, I just want to give a bit of an idea how automatic differentiation works so the basic idea is that your function you write uh, expecting real numbers to be passed into it as uh, parameters and you pass a real number back again when it's evaluated but in many languages you can uh, subvert the uh, the compiler or the interpreter uh, whereby you pass in objects that aren't actually real numbers uh, but they behave more or less as real numbers but they carry around additional information with them uh, which in particular could include the gradient function and so by just cleverly um, kind of piggybacking on top of standard operators like plus and minus and mathematical operations like sine or log or exp, you can actually coerce the, um, the computer to compute the gradient along with the actual evaluation of the function. So that, that's the idea and that's how it works. So we're gonna see a very, very simple example of this uh, done using R, um, but you know, real AD libraries are are more complicated but um, hopefully you'll get the idea. So let's uh, take an example from this uh, optimization text I've mentioned previously. Uh, we want to differentiate this function here. So it's a function of three variables x1, x2 and x3. So there it is. Um, simply enough that actually if we wanted the gradient of this function we could uh, work it out by hand that wouldn't be too difficult and so that'll give us a nice test case so um, you can go away and differentiate this by hand and uh, then you can check the answers we get using ad um, so the idea is you put in three variables x1 x2 and x3 and there is a you know slightly nasty non-linear function here that's going to illustrate uh, quite nicely how ad works um, so Normally, if you just pass in real numbers, x1, x2, and x3, this function will return f at that value. Um, but what we're going to do is sort of hijack this mathematical expression and use it to compute the gradient with respect to uh, these three variables as well as the function. And so how can we do that? Well, here's how we would write that function as a, an expression in R. 
So that's just a typical R expression involving x1, x2, and x3. And although you've probably never thought about it, you're kind of assuming when you write an expression like that, that x1, x2, and x3 are going to be real numbers and they're going to be processed as real numbers, but there's nothing directly in the expression to enforce that. And so we don't actually have to do that. But um, if we do just uh, make x1, x2, and x3 real numbers, pass them into that expression or evaluate the expression uh, for those uh, variables, uh, then we will get back a real number. But what we're now going to do is create a new class of object in R using R's um, so-called S3 object system uh, to uh, create a class called AD for automatic differentiation. And then in this AD class, um, objects are going to have a value, right? So that's going to be our regular value, our regular floating point number that's going to uh, lead to the evaluation of F. But it's also going to carry an additional attribute. So we're going to call this additional attri attribute grad. And so this is going to be our gradient vector. Right? So for example, if our uh, function is three-dimensional, then our gradient attribute will be a three vector containing the derivatives with respect to x1, x2, and x3. And then what we can do is we can redefine the kind of operators we see in this expression like plus and times and divide and uh, exp and sign so that they actually work for um, objects of this AD class as well as floating point numbers which of course we know they already work for. So here's a little function that's going to create objects for us and so we're going to use this little function AD in order to create variables. So variables for example like x1, x2 and x3 because those variables are going to have to know about a gradient as well as a value. So if we initialize it with a value x, then that's going to be the value that um, our AD object returns. So if you ask for the value of this object, we'll just get back that number. That's fine. But we're also going to create a gradient attribute, and we're going to do that um, by um, using this uh, argument here that we've called diff. And so basically the first argument here is going to be the length of our gradient vector. Uh, so for our example, that we'll want that to be three. And then the second number is going to be the index of um, the variable. So for x1, we'd want that index to be one, x2, we'd want that index to be three, etc. And so all this function does is initialize, um, but in particular, it sets the correct um, element of the gradient vector to be one and all other elements of the gradient vector to be zero. Yeah, so your gradient vector uh, is going to be a vector of zeros uh, apart from in one location where the gradient is going to be one because that's going to be the gradient of the variable with respect to itself. Okay, so here's an example of it in use. So if we want to create x1, uh, we're going to use this ad function to create this variable. We're going to pass in a value of one since we want to initialize x1 to have a value of one. We're going to say that our gradient vector has got to be of length three and this variable we're going to be creating is our first variable. It's going to have our first index in our gradient vector. Okay, and we see when we evaluate it, we just get back our value one. So that's what would be used in any real computation. Uh, but we're also going to carry around this gradient attribute, which here is just one zero zero. So the point now is that you can redefine your mathematical operations to work with vectors, uh, work with objects rather, in this AD class. And so we can do this again using R's uh, S3 object system by defining sign.ad and so what that means is that um, if you try and evaluate the sign function on an object of class AD uh, R will look for a function called sign.ad and if it can find one it will use that instead of R's built-in sign function. So here we're assuming now that we have passed in an object A of uh, class AD and the first thing this function is going to do then is pull out the gradient vector, and we'll call that grad A. Uh, so that's just uh, a numeric vector. Then we're going to pull out the numeric value from the object A, So and we're going to call that A as well, possibly slightly confusingly. So A is just going to be now the numerical value associated with our AD object. So we've got the gradient vector 
and the um, numerical value uh, associated with the input object. We're now going to compute the sign of that numerical value because this is the sign function after all, that's what we want. So that's going to be um, the value that we return, but we're also going to associate a gradient vector with this uh, object D that we're going to output. So as well as having the numerical value that we've calculated, we're also going to compute the gradient vector and associate that with the object D as well. And that gradient vector, well, just by the chain rule, uh, the derivative of sine is cos, but because this input vector, um, sorry, this input object uh, is carrying already a gradient uh, of length three, then the output gradient is also going to be this gradient vector uh, and by the chain rule, it's going to be cos A times the gradient in vector that came in. We're going to then set the class of D to be AD and return D. So the output of this function is also going to be a, an object of type AD. And that's what's going to allow us to kind of chain these things together, compose them together and compute gradients of more complicated functions. So basically inside here, we're just evaluating the function and we're also evaluating the gradient using the chain rule. And then we're passing back uh, out another object of type AD. So hopefully that's reasonably clear. Uh, and here's an example. So if we pass in our x1 that we've just defined, this uh, object of type uh, AD, we get back our value, which is the sine function applied to that object. So that's all good. Uh, but we also have the gradient attribute, which is a vector. And in this case, it's just um, cos applied to the first element and zeros for the rest of the gradient vector. So that's just um, the chain rule uh, applied to the input gradient vector. And again, it's of class AD. So that seems to be working as we would hope. And so crucially, this isn't doing symbolic differentiation, right? It's merely evaluating the gradient or the derivative of this function at the point that we're interested in, yeah, at the precise value that we're interested in. And that's just a much easier task than trying to evaluate the entire gradient function. So we can also overload operators. So we've uh, shown how you can overload sine, but now let's think about how to overload multiplication. So same principle applies. If we've got a function called uh, a star, star dot ad, uh, that is going to um, be searched for and used in preference to the built-in multiplication operation uh, for objects of type ad. So similar idea to the sine function, we're going to extract the gradient vectors associated with objects A and B. We're going to extract the numerical values associated with objects A and B. We're then going to multiply the numbers together, and that's going to be the value that we return. But we're also going to calculate the associated gradient vector, and we're going to do that now using the product rule. So we're going to take the number A and multiply the gradient vector for B, the number B and multiply the gradient vector for A, uh, add those together, and via the product rule, that's going to be the gradient of the return result. We're going to make sure that has class AD and return D. Okay, so we've overloaded multiplication of this binary operation just the same as we overloaded uh, the sine function. So we can go through this and uh, define other operations. Uh, so what we've we got here, we've got plus, times, divide, x, sine. Uh, so we can go through and define those. Uh, they're not in uh, these slides. They're also not in the PDF version of the notes that you have, uh, but they are hidden in the notes. So if you look at the R code that's extracted from the notes, um, all of the, the functions required to make this example work are uh, in that extracted R code because they're all uh, hidden in these notes in order to make these examples work. So it's a fully runnable example you've got in the R code uh, that's been extracted from these notes. So uh, if you want to go and dig in and check how the other functions are defined, uh, please go ahead and do that. So yeah, now we just do it. Um, if we define x1, x2, x3 to be regular floating point numbers and we evaluate this expression, we get this result. However, if we define x1, x2, and x3 to be variables uh, for our AD class, uh, 
um, set them up in the right way. So they've all carrying gradient vectors of length three. X1 is the first, X2 is the second, X3 is the third variable. And now we evaluate this exact same expression as far as R is concerned. We now get a comp different result, right? So the numerical result is exactly the same, so that the value is the same, of course. But we now have the associated gradient vector, which is the gradient of that function with respect to those three input variables. So we've got the gradient vector in addition to the value of the function without having to rewrite this function or this expression yeah we're using exactly the same function or expression as we would if we were just defining it to work with real variables but because of the extra kind of baggage we've created based around these ad objects um we we can get it to uh, uh coerce it if you like to uh, compute the gradient vector for us as well and you can check that it's right uh, just just by hand, and uh, these results are correct up to machine accuracy. So this is uh, this is a pretty neat trick, and you see that uh, just doing this even in R isn't too complicated. I mean, it has quite a lot of overhead in R, so you wouldn't want to do this for big complicated functions that you wanted to uh, differentiate a lot. But um, you can certainly see how the principles work quite easily with R code. So. This trick is an example of automatic differentiation, um, but it's a specific kind of automatic differentiation called forward mode, yeah? Because we're propagating derivatives forward through the uh, expression. Um, you can do that, it's, it's fine. The problem with it is it doesn't scale very well as the number of input variables increases. Uh, and in particular, it, it winds up that the the cost of doing AD kind of explodes exponentially as the number of input variables increases. So uh, in some applications where you're dealing with high dimensional functions, uh, this doesn't scale very well at all. So that there is an alternative called reverse mode. And uh, before explaining exactly what it is, um, it's more attractive in statistical contexts because instead of being exponential in the number of input variables, its cost grows exponentially in the number of output variables. But in most statistical contexts, we're dealing with a scalar valued function, you know, a function with one output. And so it doesn't matter that the cost is exponential in the number of output variables um, because we only have one. OK, uh, and it's and it's much better behaved with respect to input variables. All right, so what is it and how does it work? Um, well, let's go back to thinking exactly how this AD procedure works, right? We, so obviously we, we you know, gave a little example of how we could persuade R to do this forward mode AD, but uh, in principle, what was going on? Well, in principle, we were creating a mathematical expression or function, um, and the way that function is evaluated is, is on a computational graph. So at the bottom we have a comp computational graph. And unfortunately, I know the, um, the labels are a little bit small. Um, so you can probably see it more easily on the, the PDF notes that you have. Um, but you on the left-hand side here, you've got your input variables x1, x2, x3. Um, we're going to do things with them. And if you look back at this expression, it's clear what we need to do. So we need to multiply together x1 and x2. We need to do the sine of x3. We need to exponentiate that intermediate result. We need to uh, then add these two together. And then we need to um, divide in the end by x3. Yeah. So this is the so-called computational graph that is associated with evaluating this kind of mathematical expression or function. Um, what we actually do is we propagate information forwards through that graph until we get the final thing that we're interested in, f. And that's just evaluating it without even thinking about derivatives. Okay, But we can do that. We start at the left-hand side and we evaluate the, the bits and pieces needed to uh, evaluate this function one at a time and we proceed from these nodes on the left hand side which are called parents uh, through successive uh, children till we get the final terminal node containing our answer f 
Okay, so you need to understand how basic expression evaluation works on a graph before you think about derivatives, but hopefully uh, this is a reasonably familiar idea to everybody that um, we uh, can represent uh, these expressions using graphs like this. And as long as the graph has no loops in it, uh, it's an acyclic graph, uh, we can propagate through from the, uh, the uh, parent nodes right through to the terminal node to get the answer. Okay, so what about automatic differentiation? Let's rethink forward mode AD first. So basically what we've just looked at. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're going to just focus on one variable, yeah? So when we wrote the R code, we got it to do all three at once, but in principle, we're, we're thinking about each derivative separately in forward mode. Uh, and so we'll focus on the first variable first of all. And what we're gonna do is we're going to work our way through the graph, figuring out what the derivative of each node is with respect to that input variable. And we're doing that by using the chain rule that we've already seen. Um, and we apply the chain rule to the parents of each node. Yeah, So we break down our, our partial derivative that we're interested in at each stage by summing over the parents of that node. And we work our way through and we get to the end. And again, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, I mean, I could blow it up, I guess, a little bit. So here we're just working through, uh, looking at everything with respect to x1, and we carry things through all the way to the end until we get the derivative of f with respect to x1. And this is exactly the forward mode operation that we've seen so far. Okay, so that's forward mode. Oops. So that was just with respect to x1. If we want x2, well, we sweep through again. If we want x through x3, we sweep through again. And so we're doing lots and lots of computation on that graph in order to get all of the derivatives as well as the function evaluation. And like I said, this doesn't scale very well for uh, big comp compute graphs, especially if you've got lots of input variables. So that's the problem. So what does reverse mode do? Well, reverse mode starts, in fact, with a forward sweep through the graph to evaluate the function because you need to know where you're evaluating your function and where you want your derivative evaluating. So you have to do a forward sweep first, but you're just doing a forward sweep to evaluate the function and to also initialize uh, any edges with their correct derivatives. Yeah, But that's now the correct derivative. So if we just pick an edge here, pick this edge here, what we initialize is uh, x6 with respect to x4. So that's each node with respect to its uh, immediate parent. And that's what we label the edges with, yeah? So at each stage, that's what we're labeling the parents with. And we can do that on the forward sweep as we go through on the forward sweep to evaluate the function. We can uh, store those derivatives on the edges. That's easy enough. Okay, no, not, nothing complicated in, required to do that. No chain rule or anything. We just uh, store those uh, simple uh, parent-child derivatives on the edges on the forward sweep. Okay. So then the clever bit. Instead of working out uh, each um, derivative of f with respect to an input variable with a forward sweep through the graph, we actually now do a backward sweep through the graph, hence reverse mode, starting with um, the final node, f, we initialize that with 1, because on this backward sweep now, each node is going to figure out the derivative of f with respect to itself. Okay, so this is an arbitrary node. So we're not doing input nodes, we're doing f with respect to the current node, and we're going to sweep back until we get to the input nodes. Yeah. So each node is going to calculate the derivative of f with respect to itself, and it's going to do that using the chain rule, but now it's going to be summing over its children. So if we just zoom in again, we're going to start off with df by df is 1, 
then df by dx8 we already know then dx8 by d6 we know it's on this edge so we can work out df by dx6 using the chain rule by summing over its children it only has one child uh, so here uh, if we're interested in this one df by dx4 well we know df by dx6 we know df by dx7 and so we can work out df by dx4 using the chain rule by summing over these two edges okay and again you'll need to work through the details yourself to make sure you're happy with exactly where all of the numbers come from but the point is it's just the chain rule again it's just we're applying it backwards starting from the final node and the point then is that by the time you get back to the um the initial nodes, the, uh, the original sort of parent nodes, you've got the derivatives of f with respect to all input variables in one single sweep. So instead of having to do multiple sweeps to get the different derivatives, in one single uh, back sweep, you're getting the derivative of f with respect to each input variable. And that's why uh, for the case of a single output, and many inputs, reverse mode uh, AD is typically much, much more efficient. Okay, so uh, for big interesting statistical problems, people would use reverse mode AD, not forward mode AD. Now, of course, you know, there are various computational tricks uh, to, to make this work uh, very efficiently, but that's the basic idea. You have a forward sweep to evaluate the function, and then a backward sweep to evaluate all of the uh, derivatives. So that's it, um, and that's um, you know a super useful technique. It's implemented in lots of libraries. Uh, it's a little bit more fiddly to um, to implement. So you'll notice that I don't have any example code for doing this in R. It's a little bit more fiddly, uh, and in particular, it's it's a little bit um, tricky in that you really need to store, represent, and store that computational graph. Right, you need to do that forward sweep on the graph and then you need to do the backward sweep back over that graph. Whereas with a forward mode, because um, you were doing everything as you went forward, you could actually discard stuff as you were finished with it. So there was no explicit need to store the computational graph. So although it was less efficient, um, actually it was a little bit simpler uh, and requires uh, less storage. So there are advantages to forward mode. Um, and so in the context of reverse mode, you can see that actually doing AD through big matrices is potentially problematic, right? So if you've got an F that involves the inversion of a big matrix, say you've got some likelihood with some Gaussian component that the likelihood involves the inversion of a big matrix, say, um, you know, all of the usual sort of computational tricks apply. But nevertheless, if you're kind of doing AD through the middle of a thousand by thousand matrix inversion, you're going to have a massive computational graph and that's going to be very problematic. So in fact, doing efficient AD through matrix computations is very much sort of uh, where a lot of research is happening at the moment. So th there are costs. So a nice thing about automatic differentiation is that it doesn't require your function to be differentiable everywhere. It knows nothing about the function everywhere. It's only focused on the function at the point of interest. And so if your function does crazy things elsewhere, that really isn't a problem. So it doesn't matter if your function is defined piecewise or has jumps in it, or you know maybe the function that defines it has if statements in it. None of this really matters as long as the function is continu uh, continuous and differentiable at the point that you're actually interested in differentiating it. Uh, so that's very nice um, and means that you often don't have to worry about uh, special edge cases, but actually you do have to be aware that uh, the function does have to be differentiable at the point that you're interested in and if your function is defined in a in a non-trivial way where it's not necessarily immediately obvious that it's differentiable at that point then you may have issues so here's just a, a little example that if you've got this box cox transformation here um, that's all fine it doesn't matter that the transformation is defined piecewise uh, you can dif differentiate it at um, any lambda that you like um, however, even though 
this function is actually differentiable at lambda equals zero because it's defined piecewise in this uh, slightly strange way uh, you're not actually going to necessarily get the correct uh, value for your AD derivative if you were to evaluate this using the AD procedure that I've described at precisely lambda equals zero, right? Because in fact, if you're evaluating at precisely lambda equals zero, you'd only be picking up the second case in that piecewise definition and, and lambda just wouldn't come into it at all. So uh, just be aware that if you do have like a funny function like this and you're wanting to evaluate derivatives at funny edge cases, then um, there are potential problems. But in fact, uh, in most cases, um, it works surprisingly well. So this now kind of raises the um, question of when would you ever use finite differences? Uh, do you always use automatic differentiation for everything? Uh, how, when would you use forward mode rather than reverse mode, etc.? So in general, for statistical applications, as we've said, uh, reverse mode tends to be more efficient, though there are still some edge cases where it's still problematic. Um, it can be more costly than finite differencing. Um, and so there is potentially a trade-off there. Uh, however, uh, AD is so much more stable than finite differencing. You know, we've seen those issues with finite differencing. And so you do need to be aware that uh, finite differencing, you know, does carry uh, risks, even though it's often quite cheap. Um, so one thing you could do is use AD to calibrate your finite difference intervals, right? So uh, you choose your step size by uh, seeing what helps you match up with the AD and then run with uh, your finite differences because they're cheaper and maybe recalibrate later to make sure your finite differences are still consistent with AD, etc. So you could use AD to help tune finite differences if uh, your finite differences are a lot cheaper than AD. But these days with the developments in automatic differentiation libraries and the fact that they can now uh, take advantage of multi-core processes and even uh, GP, GPUs, um, the balance is definitely swinging in the favor of using reverse mode AD for absolutely everything uh, involving gradients on a computer. Um, so I think uh, uh, that's the way things are headed and we're, we'll see. But um, I think that's a good place to break.